Hey, good evening, church. What a great privilege it is for us to be together one more time to open the book and study the Word of God. So glad you're here tonight. I think you're really going to get a lot out of this study. I hope you had a great Wednesday. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to gather before God's truth and learn. And I just trust that God has something special for you tonight as you prepare your heart and come to Him. I pray it's so. Tonight we're going to talk about something that I've called authority and submission. It's one of those passages where some people just get stuck. They just can't handle it. They know the Bible says it, but they don't know why the Bible says it. They don't want the Bible to say it, and it becomes contentious for them. Nonetheless, I think if we interpret this well, you'll see that it's really one thing God has designed to function in relationship here. And, and we'll get to it in a minute, but before we do, I just want to bring an announcement or two before you, if that's possible. Let's just look at this. Remember that next Wednesday night will be our Issues and Answers night, the first Wednesday night of every month. So if you are available for um, that session, we'd love to have you. If you do have issues or you're having questions that you'd like answered from a biblical perspective, you can submit them in the comment section below or you can send me an email at Pastor Scott at welcome to livinghope.com. We'd be more than happy to address whatever concern or question you may have. Uh, I just hope you can come, all right? That'd be great. And before we begin tonight into the lesson, we're going to be in Colossians 3. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. I will, I will have slides for you as well. But I want to pray before we start tonight, all right? Let's pray together. Father God, we're so thankful for another day. You've given us life. You've given us breath. God, we want to serve you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We want to understand who you are from your word. We need your help. God, we don't want to just know some more facts about you. We want to internalize these things and live like you've called us to live through your word. God, give us that grace, I pray. For the one here that's looking but has never come into relationship with you, Lord, I pray that you'd open the eyes of the heart, that you draw that dear one to yourself and allow them to understand that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah, that their greatest need in life is to yield their life to you. I pray that you'd show them that and bring them to salvation even today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Oh, and by the way, if you do... I pray the prayer, come to Christ and surrender your life to him, and you don't really know where to get started, uh, be sure you put those, uh, or put whatever questions you might have in the comment section below so that I can help you get started, point you in the right direction in terms of scripture reading programs and things like that that will help you start, all right? Okay, so here we go, on to Col Colossians chapter 3. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit first. We're, we're going to start at verse 18 when we get there, but in verse 10, I just want you to see what we've been talking about in this section. He says, you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Okay, so there's been a transformation in your life because you've surrendered yourself to Jesus Christ. You remember the argument, right, from last week, put off the old self, put on the new self. That's that's the thrust of this whole section. Demonstrate the transformation that's occurred inside of you on the outside. That your life might be obedient to Christ. That it might be worthy, walking worthy. That you might set your mind on things above. That, that you would become a person that's saturated with the person of Jesus Christ and his word. You let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You're walking with him. When that happens to somebody's life, they're putting on the new self. God has saved them, reconciled them, filled them with his spirit. And how do you put on the new self? Well, you get renewed in knowledge. You, you continue to pursue God's truth as he's revealed it in his word. That's how you learn how to understand who God is. You learn how to understand who you are from God's perspective. And you also learn the behaviors that honor God and the behaviors that God hates. All right? This is the fundamental message of Scripture that we're transformed when we come to know Him. All right. 
God has done that in us if we've come to Jesus Christ. Now that should have far-reaching implications for the societies that we live in. Why? Because when we are born again, new creations in Christ, we want to serve him. And if you think about all the philanthropy and all the um, service to those who are down and out, if you look across the spectrum of the nation, who's doing the work to bring the orphans at home, to feed those that are hungry, to help the homeless, all these sorts of ministries, who is normally at the, at the bottom of all those efforts in the root position? It's normally a Christian. It's normally somebody that God has touched to say, let me allow you, the transformation I have brought to your life impact the world. All right? God puts us to work. We're, we're walking in the light as he's in the light. He loves the world. So do we. And we want to serve the world through truth and through service, love. All right. So put on the new self. That's sort of the background of where we are today. In Colossians 3.17, Paul sort of summarizes what he's been saying. And he says, look, whatever you do, okay, from A to Z, whatever you do, whether it's your speech or your action, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? It means you're doing everything you do, fully aware of the fact that you now love Jesus more than anything in your life, that you now serve him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You belong to him. He's transformed you. You're a new creation. Everything that happens from there is done to honor him. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There it is. God, we thank you. I don't care what my circumstances are. I know I still belong to you, God. I thank you. No matter how hard it feels or how discouraged I may get, God, I thank you because I know you're in charge and I am living my life to obey you. You know the number of hair on my head. There's nothing that's going to happen outside of your sovereign will for me. So I rest and I trust and I love you. And here we go. I'll give thanks in everything I do, whether it's something I say or something I do. Now, here comes the practical application of what that looks like in real life. Paul starts with the marriage relationship. That's the first place he addresses in this se section. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now just think about this. This is where a lot of people just choke. Oh, it can't mean what it says. It can't really mean that a wife has to submit herself to her husband, can it? This is so unpopular in our day and age. And in some cases, I'd say rightfully so, because the husbands have been so mean and so ungodly towards their wife that who would want to submit to that? Nonetheless, here's the command of Scripture for the Christian wife. Okay, it's not very hard to understand whether this verse applies to you. Are you a Christian wife or not? If you are, then this is for you. Submit to your husbands. That's the simple expression. It's amazing to me how God times things. We were just in 1 Corinthians 11 this morning for the Living Hope Today devotional, and that passage as well deals with submission to the husband by the wife. And it goes into great detail there. But here, Paul just rattles it off. Part of the transformation Part of the new expression of life because you've come to Christ is wife. You're going to understand that you're under the authority of your husband as God has designed it. It's not about equality. Let me say it again. Did you get that? It's not about equality. It's not that somebody's greater than the other and so the husband gets to lord it over the wife. Hey, the Bible says you need to submit so, you know, it's time to get up and polish my shoes. It's not like that. This is not what's being said. It's not the point. In fact, let's just look at it for a minute. If you if you talk about the word submit, it means becoming subject to. It, in the Greek, it's the word hupotasso, and it's primarily a military term, to rank under. 
Hypo means under and tasso is to arrange or to put in subjection, to subject. Now, thinking about this definition, giving it uh, a military rank, let's just use that for an illustration. You got the general, right? Everybody salutes the general because the general's at the top, right? And then I don't know my ranks very well, but you get all the way down to the private. Now, is the private less of a person than the general? Not at all. In fact, the private might be smarter than the general. The, the private might have great intellect that the general doesn't have. The private might have more attributes in terms of his ability to function in this world than the general does. They're, they're not unequal in terms of their manliness. Where are they different? they're different in their authority okay because the private has to submit to the general it's not about whether he's less of a man no it's about whether he's under the authority of the general in fact if you've ever been to basic training one of the things they drill into you is that you are under the authority of the military people above you in rank right you jump up, you salute, you, you obey orders, or you get kicked out. Or, you know, that's how it is. Okay, well think about this. This scripture is not telling us that a woman is loved less by God, or that a woman is somehow less valuable to God, or that a woman isn't loved by God, or, or cherished, or gifted, or talented. It's not telling us anything about substance. It's telling us about roles. God designed this world to be this way. If you read what we studied this morning in 1 Corinthians 11, you see that God designed it, that he made Adam, and then from Adam he made Eve, and, and that Adam was created first, and Eve was created to help Adam. That's what the, New, or the Old Testament says in the creation accounts. Okay. Well, that's the fundamental foundational place to start. Now you say, well, the women, I can just hear them. I would never submit my life to a man. Well, if you don't want to be married, that's your choice. But just understand, one of the greatest places to be is where God wants you to be. And if you're in a marriage, God wants you, wife, to be submissive to that husband, knowing that he's imperfect as he is, but knowing that the God that created both you and him are he the God is telling us this is how I want the roles of marriage to be determined and play out I want you to think about this with me remember what Jesus said in John 5 <clears throat> so Jesus said to them truly truly I say to you the son that's him can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Notice this verse, please. Do you see that Jesus himself, as he walked this earth, he lived in submission to the authority of the Father. The Son can do nothing of his own accord. The Son voluntarily gives up his rights to submit to the will of the Father, you remember what he prayed, right? Uh, if you can take this cup from me, okay, but nonetheless, not my will, but yours be done. I'm going to submit my will to you. I'm going to be under your authority, and I'm going to walk with you as you lead me. Now, Jesus had a little better chance of getting it uh, uh, right where he needs to be because the Father is absolutely perfect, right? <laughs> It's, it's easier to serve somebody when they're perfect than that, that husband that's not perfect at all. That might be harder to submit to, but nonetheless, this is the command. And we see the same pattern in the life of Jesus. Submission to the father for Jesus. The wife submits to the husband. And lest husband, you sit there and think you're okay, I, I want you to just look at this verse. We looked at it this morning, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. Don't think for a minute, husband or father or man, whether you're married or not, that you're not under authority. 
The Bible clearly says that every man is under the authority of Christ. Christ said what? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We all answer to him for how we live. We all answer to him for how we treat our wives and our children and our family members and our friends and our boss and our employees and whatever sphere of life you're in. Every man is under the authority of Jesus Christ. All right, look at the rest of this passage in 1 Corinthians 11. The head of a wife is her husband. What does that mean? It means the wife, by God's design, is under the authority of her husband. Okay, now that might be hard for us to hear in modern times because, you know, women's liberation and all has brought women to the top. We, we need all these things now to function well as, as women. We want our rights. We want this. We want that. Okay, I don't think the Bible would deny you rights in terms of... Uh, living this life in equality. But I do think in a marriage relationship, the Bible would say if you're going to obey God, you've got to recognize the role that God has put the wife in. In the same way, every man's under Christ, okay? It's not like they're just uh, free to do whatever they want. Although many have taken this concept of submission and abuse their wives with it by making them do all kinds of things and throwing this verse in their face. Well, I want you to see this. And the head of Christ is God. The point is, the Lord Jesus, like we just saw in John 5, submits to the will of the Father. So in the providence of God, following Jesus means that we deny ourselves even within the marriage relationship, we deny ourselves. And think of the responsibility the husband has if he's under Christ to lead his family in godliness and to be someone who is, who is setting a godly example. Think of the burden of being the head of the household to stay in submission to Christ and to follow Christ on a daily, minute-by-minute -minute basis to allow God to bless that union and let that wife who's in submission to her husband flourish. I'm sure it's no problem to submit to a husband that's doing everything he can to follow God and loving his wife like he loves himself. It's when you find that husband that's using a verse like these to, to subject the wife to abuse. You know, I'm the king and you're not. I get to do whatever I want and you don't. This is not biblical at all. In fact, let's just look as the passage in Colossians continues. Husbands. Okay, so just one verse for wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. All right. That's fitting in the Lord. That's his design. Okay? You're in the Lord and doing well when you follow that um, command. Wives, submit to your husband. Okay. Husbands. What are you supposed to do? Husbands, boss your wives around and get them to do whatever you want. Is that what it says? That's not what it says. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, I want to stop on love your wives because many times in modern culture, we look at love emotionally. Love is about feelings. I feel warm, fuzzy feelings about this person or that person or... I have an emotional attachment to this or that. I mean, just think how we use the word. I, I love football. I love peanut butter. I love my dog. Uh, you know, I love to go on vacation. I love that song. Uh, and I love Jesus. And oh yeah, I love my wife. If love is nothing more than some sort of emotional response to how good somebody makes me feel, then it's not a biblical love. No, God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. When God talks about love, he talks about giving our very best for the person regardless of whether they deserve it or not. His love for us is not based on our loveliness. We don't deserve his love. We're not lovely. We're in active rebellion. And still, he sends his son his precious son, his only begotten son, the greatest uh, possession of his own being. I'm sending you myself. 
to die for you, even though you reject me. Think about that. Husbands, love your wives. I want you to understand what this verse is not saying. This verse is not saying, husbands, try to have warm, fuzzy feelings about your wife as long as she does what you want her to do. No, this is not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying, husbands, regardless of how lovely your wife is, even if she's not nice, even if it's hard because she's she's reacting to whatever it may be where she is not responding uh, in a way that's appropriate, it doesn't lessen the husband's requirement to love his wife. What does Ephesians say? Like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He laid down his life. All right? Do not be harsh. Do not be harsh. Now, see, the the wives... <laughs> They, they don't want to submit to the husband because the husband's acting like he's the CEO and everybody around him's the employee. No, the Bible's structure here is about roles. Everybody is equal in terms of personhood. But understand, God says, wives, submit to your husbands. But then he puts the burden on the husband. Husband, you need to love your wife and do not be harsh. Do not be harsh. I counsel a few young men, you know, before they get married, and I try to explain to them, you know, it doesn't matter how tough that wife might look and how strong she may appear, she's like a little china teacup in the sense that her heart is so delicate. You want to be harsh with that person? It's like just banging that teacup on the, on the table. You're going to crack it every time you're mean, every time you're harsh. These are things she never forgets. The Bible's instruction to the husband, love your wife. So we're talking about the overall transformation that happens when we come to Jesus Christ by faith. So we started with wives. Now we've covered husbands. Who do you think's next? Well, let's just round out husbands for a second. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's Ephesians 5. By the way, We did a study in Ephesians 5 a few months ago. You can add to your understanding by going back and watching that if you prefer. But in the end, husbands, you really got to get this because (laughs) there's a lot of husbands out there that are so happy about these verses. They're not going to serve Christ. They're not yielded to Christ. But they know this verse. I'm going to throw it in my wife's face every time she does something I don't want her to do. I'm going to tell her she has to submit. No, that's not what these passages talk about. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. Did you get that, husbands? Love your wife as yourself. In other words, whatever you're requiring, would you do that as well? Would would you be the one that would subject yourself to that? Love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. There's mutuality here. And in a loving relationship centered on Jesus Christ and walking in the truth of God's word, there is no more, there is no better place of peace and community loving one another than exactly as God has it set up. I know that from experience. Praise God. In the end, now we move to children. Wives, husbands, now children. Listen, children, what's the command here? Obey your parents man is this one that's been lost right it's it's turned around anymore in our culture parents obey your children whatever they decide they want to do you better make sure you do it (laughs) that's not what the bible says children obey your parents do what your parents tell you oh i'm supposed to obey my parents when they're telling me what i want and, and and that i agree with what they're saying No, you're supposed to obey your parents in everything. I mean, we're assuming they're godly parents. We're assuming that they're not leading you into sin. But children, as you are under the authority of your mother and father, your response to them is obedience in whatever they tell you. For this pleases the Lord. Children, in Ephesians 6, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. When the Bible says something more than once, I mean, it's time to pay attention, right? We pay attention when it says it once. 
But when it says it over and over, God's making a point. He wants children under the authority of their parents, not parents under the authority of their children. I, I know parents that are just being ruled by their children because their children have manipulated the situation to the point where the parents can't say no. In fact, this is very common with children of divorce because they learn how to play this one against that one. You know, dad's going to let me do it if you don't let me do it, mom. Mom's going to let me do it if you don't let me do it, dad. And before you know it, they've leveraged themselves in, in the relationships so that they always get their way. Well, children are called by God to obey their parents in the Lord. There's a qualifier as far as the parents are giving godly choice, godly advice, godly instruction to the child. For this is right. In Ephesians 6, it goes on, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. What was the promise? That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. In other words, God is qualifying this instruction to obey your parents, children, with the promise that he's going to bless you with long life as you honor your mother and your father. He's going to bless you with long life. Okay, so we've talked about wives, we've talked about husbands, we've talked about children. Now let's talk about fathers. 321, fathers, do not provoke your children. Now you know, <laughs> there's a lot of verses in the Bible that are so easily understood. You know, that people say, oh, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say, and it's so hard to understand, and blah, blah. Well, look at this. I mean, wives, submit to your husbands. Is that hard? That's not hard to understand. You might not want to do it, but it doesn't mean you don't understand. Husbands, love your wives. Is that hard to understand? Not at all. Children, obey your parents. Is that hard to understand? Not at all. It might be hard to do. But the teaching is clear. And now we come to fathers. Do not provoke your children. Fathers, do you provoke your children? Are you the one that's constantly on them? You think you're going to make them tough or something by being mean to them? Do not provoke your children. Why? Lest they become discouraged. But you can drive a child to despair through being mean to them, through provoking them. And your words are enough to make it happen. The Bible says, look, this is not the way. You want to be a godly father? You want to be a father that follows the truth that God has given us about parenting? Well, here's one thing. You can't provoke your child. Can you discipline them? Yes. Can you instruct them? Yes. But can you constantly be on them to put them down, tell them they're not going to be worth anything. I, I knew a family once where I was doing the funeral of the father, and the, the boys were grown. I mean, they were 30-something-year-old men by the time their father died. Maybe it was even older, 40-something. You know, this young man, I call him young because I'm so old, but this guy in his 40s who just lost his father, you know what he said to me? In tears, he started telling me about how mean his father was to him. And he told me a story. His father was the umpire at his Little League baseball game when he was a child. This was some 20 years before, all right? The father is there behind the plate being the umpire. Here comes the pitch. The son is standing at the plate with bat in hand. The pitch is obviously outside. It comes into the catcher's mitt, and the father cries out, Strike one. The son looks at the father. What are you talking about? That was way outside. Here comes the next pitch. Another ball. Way outside. Strike two. Here comes the third pitch. Way outside again. Strike three, you're out. That son never recovered from that moment. He's crying at the loss of his father. And what he's remembering is how harsh... His father was with him, trying to make him tough. No, you know, the father's job is to love the child and to do what's best for the child, not to discourage the child. It lasts a lifetime when you're mean to the child. 
please, fathers, pay attention to this verse. Be convicted by it and change how you treat your kids because this is really a powerful life lesson and it lasts a lifetime. If you get it wrong, if you continue to be harsh with your kids and you, and you hurt them emotionally, verbally, maybe even physically, you're way out of bounds from what the Bible instructs you to do as a godly father. Now, Paul moves on. Wives, husbands, children, fathers, now bond servants. Now you recall, and I don't know, I don't get this experience myself, but in the ancient world and in many households today all over the world, there's the family that lives there and then there's the help, the people that um, serve the family. They're not part of the family legally speaking, but they live in the house and they help the family from day to day life, right? That's who he's talking to now, bond servants. Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. What is Paul doing here as he writes the Church of Colossae? He's basically telling them, look, when you put on the new self, when you walk in the light as Christ is in the light, then you submit yourself to the people in your life that God has placed in authority over you. That's the basic premise of tonight's passage. You submit yourself, whether you're a husband submitting yourself to God, a wife submitting yourself to a husband, a child submitting yourself to your parents, or a bondservant submitting yourself to earthly masters. God sees you. His best choice for you is to continue where you are, to do what you do for his glory in submission. It's not by way of eye service. Do you see this? Not by way of eye service. In other words, your obedience is not meant to be, oh, they're looking at me, so I have to act like I'm going to do it now. No, it has to be from the heart. Whether you're looking at me or not, I'm going to follow God by being submissive to you as God has called me. It's not about being people pleasers, right? The one who says, oh, sure, boss, but then turns around and doesn't do it. But with sincerity of heart. And look at the last line in this verse, fearing the Lord. Why would you have to fear the Lord when you're trying to serve your, your master here on earth? Well, because God's watching. And God's saying, look, you're in submission to this person by my design. Now, if you're set free, okay, great, be set free. But as long as you're in that household and under the authority of the head of that household, live in a way that honors God live in a way that honors God. That's the highest priority. In fact, he says, whatever you do, work heartily. Okay, so this is a great testimony and instruction for us about just being employed wherever we are, whether we're running the lawnmower service or we're the IT guy that knows all about computers or we're, we're cooking food in a restaurant all day, wherever we are in life. We have to understand that if we've put on this new self to live our lives by denying ourselves and taking up our crosses and following Jesus, then we have put ourselves in subjection to him and he has put us under the authority of those that have authority over us. Okay, but when we work, we're not working for ourselves. Do you see what it says here? As for the Lord. In other words, I might have a boss, and the boss might think I, I really like him and I'm doing a great job because I want to impress him. But the truth is, whether I like him or not, my motivation isn't about trying to uh, earn his favor somehow. My, my motivation is about, I serve Jesus Christ. I'm not interested in whether he likes me or not primarily. I want him to, sure, but... The main thing I want to do is be faithful to Jesus Christ in the employment that he's given me. I will work heartily, just as if the Lord Jesus himself was sitting next to me watching my every move. I, I'm not working for men. This is such a critical thing to think about when you think about the job you have. Who are you doing it for? Are you just trying to get by? Do you understand how intimately involved God is with the sustaining you through employment, just understand that God's there saying, hey, do your best. I'm going to give you the strength. I'm going to give you the guidance. I want you to work like you're working for me because that's really how it is. You're mine. You're my servant. Serve me by serving this one. 
submit to the one over you. All right. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive an, the inheritance as your reward. Now that's a beautiful verse. When I when I work for my boss, the best I can do is a paycheck, maybe a 401k. Here, what's going to happen to me? You will receive the inheritance as your reward. The Lord Jesus is tracking us. He knows when we're obedient and he is paying attention to how we serve others and he's got a reward that's what he says you are serving the lord christ there's the point your work should never be the same again because as you work you work for the lord jesus christ because you belong to him if you've come to him by faith and surrendered your life to him you belong to him that's why you know that his reward is waiting for you. What a glorious truth. How many of us hate our jobs and just it's just drudgery to get through our job every day. We're looking at that clock 10 times an hour going, oh, please, could you just hurry up so I can punch out and get out of here? God says, no, no, wait a minute. Get a healthy perspective about your work. Think about it in terms of you're serving me because you belong to me. Think about it in terms of you're going to be rewarded by me because you belong to me you're serving the lord christ that's the testimony of scripture so as we go from there he brings us home to the point to say this for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done in other words you want to violate these things you want to go against what god has said you want to live your life your way because it's your choice and you're free and you can do whatever you want God says, okay, you don't want to submit? You can go that way and you can cause all the trouble that you will cause if you go that way. But understand, God's paying attention. The wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. There's no partiality. I don't care if you're the pastor, if you're the husband, if you're the wife, if you're the father, if you're the bond servant. Wherever you are as God has placed you, if you want to live the way you want to live, that's up to you. But God is paying attention. And he's pleading with us. Remember that I'm, I'm setting you on the path that's going to be the best for you. It's where you're going to grow the most. It's where you're going to learn the most. It's where you're going to experience my presence. As you walk with me, honor me first. Everything else is going to work out. Well, I don't mean to keep you tonight. I do want to just say... What a tremendous lesson about authority and submission. You and I need to look in our lives and say, who has God placed above us and beneath us? In the, not in, again, not in terms of value, but in terms of role. Okay. What are we doing to serve God in that setting, wherever we are? Husbands, are you loving your wife as yourself? Wife, are you submitting to your husband? Children, are you obeying your parents? If you're in the household and under, under the authority as a servant, are you serving with all your heart? Remember, wherever you're working, you're working to please the Lord. You're working for Him, and He will reward us. I trust you learned something. If you have questions or comments, please leave them below. I'd love to respond to you in each one individually. I read them all, and I praise God for you, church. I pray that you serve Him well.